I'm Sally Rieger, Chair of the Lower Farmington River and Salmon Brook Wild and Scenic Study. This is a Lower Farmington River and Salmon Brook Wild and Scenic Study committee me meeting, but we have a special speaker tonight. I'm just going to take two minutes to give you a quick update on Wild and Scenic, since there are a lot of people here who aren't on the committee and don't get those newsletters. One is, in case you don't know it, we are not yet designated. We've been working on this for 10 years, and our bill has been introduced in Congress in DC for the fourth time this, this congressional session. It made it once again through the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources, and it is now attached to a bipartisan energy bill, and hopefully one day the Senate will vote on that bipartisan energy bill and pass it along to the House. And if that happens, then we have to hope that the House Committee on Natural Resources will really like the little changes we made to the bill at the request of the committee chair who blocked it last time. The changes are meaningless in the sense that they are already provided for under the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, but he wanted it spelled out, so it's spelled out now as best we could. So we don't know when it's going to happen, but we're hoping it will eventually happen. Everyone says it's going to happen, but we haven't seen it happen yet. <laughs> so if we get really discouraged, we've talked about, we're just going to call it wild and scenic and forget the people of DC. But we really aren't supposed to do that. So, <laughs> so tonight we have a special speaker who is Dr. Kenneth Fader, we also know him around the watershed as Kenny. Kenny is perfect. Dr. Fader is my father, so <laughs> I won't recognize that name. He's been a very good friend to Wild and Scenic, and he's been a very good friend to the watershed for many years. He teaches in the anthropology department at Central Connecticut State University, and his big interest is in Native American life in New England, and he has that to talk about tonight, and also his book on sure. ancient, ancient America, 50 archaeological sites you can see for yourself. Wow. She, she did that better than me. I never remember the title. <laughs> <laughs> I went through so many iterations. Um, my original title was, was um, what was it? Uh, an Archaeological Odyssey, and the publisher said, uh, nobody knows what an odyssey is. <laughs> and, I, and it took me two years to learn how to spell odyssey, so I was really disappointed. Uh, thank you all. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, I do a lot of public speaking. I never know how many people are going to show up. So I've spoken to groups of like three or four <laughs> and groups of several hundred. Uh, I went up to a, a, a college, a private college up in Massachusetts a couple of years ago. And there's a big, beautiful auditorium, 250 seats. They had food all set up. It was great. And I walked in and there were exactly five people in the audience. And one of them was the dean of the college who had invited me. Two were professors. One was a student. And one was some neighbor who saw the lights on and wondered what was going on. And, and I, you know, it was disappointing for me, but you know, I gave my lecture just the same. It made no real difference. And the next day, this is, I, you can't make this stuff up. The next day, the dean of the college called me up to apologize for the very low attendance. And she said it was her mistake. She had scheduled two events at the college, same time, same night. And the other, I said, well, what was the other event that, that brought all the people in? They had a clown making balloon animals in the, in the student union. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I cannot compete with a clown making balloon animals. So these days, I stipulate, and I didn't with Sally, I should have, that if I'm asked to participate, to give a lecture, I stipulated that there will be no balloon animal making clowns within a 50 mile radius of the venue because I don't want to go through that again. So thank you all. That's, a, that's absolutely a true story, up until the stipulation that there are no. If there are balloon animal making clowns, that's fine. Um, I'm here to talk about, Sally contacted me and said, well, we want you to give this talk. We want it to be partially about your work in the Farmington Valley 
and partially about ancient America. Oh, God, those are two entirely separate things. Should I do two PowerPoints? And how am I going to merge them? So the last couple of days, I said, oh, I've got to put these slides together. So I'm putting together the PowerPoint, and I realize it actually works. There actually is a fundamental thematic uh, um, uh, plan that undergrids both of my talks, and you'll see that when it happens. I'm going to start with my work in the Farmington Valley. When I began, I, I've been teaching at Central Connecticut State University for a very long time. Some of the sites I excavate now, I'm actually a little bit older than those sites. So, um, and when I started, a, a, I think you, you guys, if you're living in the Farmington Valley, you'll probably appreciate the humor behind this. Um, I needed a, a research project to involve students in, and I immediately thought, well, I'm Central, it's fairly near the Farmington Valley. I was living in Farmington at the time. And I told my colleagues, I'm going to be digging in the Farmington Valley. And they all said the same thing. They said, oh, really not the best idea. I said, why? Well, small river valley, a lot of in upland areas. You're not going to find any really important sites there. OK, Lewis Walpole in, in Farmington, that's an important site. But that's the confluence of the Pequabic and the Farmington. All right, the Ragged Net Rock Shelter up in Bark Hampstead. More about that later. Yeah, that's an important site, but it's a rock shelter. There are always sites in rock shelters. But the rest of the valley, maybe there were people in the past kind of moving through it. Maybe. Maybe seasonally there. But you won't find a lot of sites in the Farmington Valley. So I figured, well, it doesn't hurt for me to try to find sites in the Farmington Valley. And I always tell my students, negative information is important. This works really well for me when I've got students out in the field for days and days and days and they're digging holes and not finding anything. And I go over and I say, nothing? No, I haven't found anything. And I go, that's really interesting. That's, that's important. Because then I turn around and walk away and I go, I don't know, I don't laugh. But negative information is important. So I figured if I spend a few years in the Farmington Valley looking for sites in Farmington, in Simsbury, in Avon, and in the western part of Canton, in New Hartford, Bar Hampstead, if we didn't find much, we would know more than we knew before. However, the assumption that we are looking not going to find much in there turns out not to be true. Um, this map is a map. Every one of those red diamonds is an archaeological site that we encountered during the Farmington, our, 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 our uh, application of the Farmington River Archaeological Project. So we've got lots and lots and lots of sites. And you can see there's the Farmington River and a lot of sites in the north flowing branch of the river, a bunch of sites. Actually, this map is incomplete, but we have a lot more sites in the western part of the valley as well. So we have lots and lots and lots of archaeological sites. And it only makes sense. First of all, let's talk a little bit about history. So I began looking at the historical records. This is a photograph of a, a treaty uh, signed in, in 1673. All of these names here are the marks of Indian sachems. So these are all Tonksis and Masako and other Indians who are signing the document. This, by the way, is the first map of the Farmington Valley. Oh, right yeah. here. All right? <laughs> and now, if you look at it, what's weird about this map? South is at the top. That's typical of old maps. And when you think about it, north isn't up or down. It's wherever you arbitrarily decided to be. There's no up or down in space. So, so maps commonly were the opposite of the, the, the modern uh, way we put set, set of maps. Now you notice there's this thing called Round Hill right there. In all documents, Round Hill is listed as a large glacial deposit that's 60 feet high. <laughs> I went looking for it when I first came into the Farmington Valley, and the people in the town hall in Farmington told me, oh, Round Hill, yeah, we moved that. <laughs> um, all of the fill that's under the sewage treatment plant, which they are now expanding, that was a glacial deposit, this big, tall hill. So I was able to figure out you know, where it was. I don't know if this, yeah, there you go. Um, it's, it's Round Hill Square. But that hurts my brain to say Round Hill Square. Square Hill Round? What's that about? Um, that's actually an old sign. I think they've replaced that sign now. It's a little shopping plaza business area. That's where Round Hill was. But now knowing where Round Hill was and knowing that in that 1673 treaty, it specifically tells me the direction and distance that Round Hill is from the Tonksis Indian Village of 1650. And sure enough, 
it's behind the sewage treatment plant. And if you walk the plowed fields there, you find Native American artifacts and European American artifacts mixed together because they're trading with the European settlers who are on um, the other side. Oops. Now this, I flipped the map upside down. So, so all the words are upside down, but now north is at the top. So from Round Hill, Farmington is defined as five miles to the north, 10 miles to the south, three miles to the east, and eight miles to the west. That's Farmington. All right, so now I'll read this from, oops. So that includes Avon, Farmington, most of Burlington, um, Plainville, two-thirds of New Britain, a uh, bunch of Southington, and on and on and on, Br uh, most of Bristol. That's 300 square miles. By the way, by the time the Europeans are done settling the land claims, they have 300 square miles, and they've left the Indians 300 acres. <laughs> and in the treaty, by the way, in the treaty, the English are, this is in Hartford before the Revolution, the English are very clear that the Indians got the better deal, and they, they flat out say, because after all, the Indians got us Englishmen to live among them. And that's far more beneficial than all that land they gave up. They say that out loud <laughs> in, the, in the document. Um, the act, the Indian village is right here, um, the Tosas Indian village. And in fact, that village is still there. So when we're looking at these historical documents, we know that the historical baseline, middle of the 17th century, yes, there are Tungsus Indians living, there are Masako Indians. We know where some of their locations are. We know from early histories of people building um, houses in East Weetog that they are encountering Indian burials and digging them up, and we don't know what became of those. We, are, we hear about places along the river in Avon and Farmington where hundreds, thousands of arrowheads are being picked up so many that the, the, the legend is that a great war took place there. But in fact, we're just looking at an accumulation over a very long period of time of a lot of people moving in and out of the valley, leaving behind broken stuff, hiding stuff for, for future use and never coming back for it. And those things are all the archaeological artifacts that we deal with. Um, this is typical. This is up on the top of Talcott Mountain. Um, I bring my students here. We, I get students digging with me. Uh, from all over the country. So people who have never been to Connecticut, never been to New England, and they're just, one of the things we take for granted is how green this place is. So I got students coming in from the Southwest who they fly in and they go, it's just so green. They've never seen anything like it. We take it for granted. Oh, yeah, it's green. That's trees. But you know, when you've, there are trees every 14 or 15 miles uh, where they come from, it's very, very different. So I take them up to the top. And then I bring them down onto Nod Road, and I show them the floodplain of the river in front of us. The river's behind me. This is in the fall, obviously. And there's uh, the High Blind Tower. So one year, I had a student from uh, California. And I brought him out to show them Talcott Mountain. And she wasn't being ironic, and she wasn't trying to be funny. But I pointed and said, there's Talcott Mountain. And she looked at me, and she said, where? <laughs> and I said, right there, right in front of you. And she goes, I don't see it. I said, no, it's, it's right there in front of you. She literally said, is it on the other side of the hill? <laughs> and I said, no, that's the Talcott Mountain. So she laughed, we had a good laugh about it. Um, she went home that, of course, in the summer, and she sent me a postcard. All right, this is, the Whitney, this is Mount Whitney, and on the back of the postcard, it says, here, Ken. This is a mountain. <laughs> well, what are you going to do? For us, the Talcott Mountain is a really important landmark. It actually separates um, Indian tribes on different sides of that mountain. That was uh, the, the thing, going off on a tangent here, in the winter sometimes, Route 44 closes. It's, it's a real barrier to trade and transportation and travel. And you can imagine what that was a thousand years ago, or five thousand years ago, ten thousand years ago, it is genuinely a, p a point that demarcates one group of natives from another group of natives, and we find different raw materials being used, different rock types, depending on which side of Talcott Mountain you end up on. Um, this is, if you've climbed to the top of Talcott Mountain, hiked to the top, you're familiar with this. This is an absolutely stunning uh, bedrock exposure of basalt, that's a volcanic rock. 
And that's been sitting there for 180 million years since the last igneous um, activity uh, hit this part of the world. And that rock erodes in these long, narrow blades. And Native Americans picked this stuff up as much as 5,000 years ago, they knew where the good basalt was, the good rock that nature had provided them. They climbed to the top of Talcott Mountain. The reason I know that is I find these chunks of basalt miles away from the source, the bedrock source. The only way it's getting there is if somebody climbs to the top of that mountain, grabs those pieces, and brings them down to their village. And I will show you a spear point in a little bit made from Talcott Mountain basalt 5,000 years ago. And all these, all these, the archaeologists are, I think, as a matter of course, environmentalists. Because the environment provides us with the background, the stage, that, that marks the, the, what the, 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 ex, the experience of ancient people. They rely on natural resources for their survival, and they're never going to live too far away from a fresh source of water. They're not going to live too far away from where there's good stone or good clay for making pottery. They're not going to live too far away from a place where there's good wood for construction and for fuel. And so we look at the Farmington Valley, we try to put ourselves in the position of ancient people. Where would we settle? Where would we put a village? Where would we put a camp? Where would we put a place, a quarry, based on the raw materials that are there? And here's something that I will guarantee you, take this to the bank. If we know about important resources in the valley, the native people knew about at least two or three times as many. There are rock sources. I know they, that the natives found these rock types, and they make tools out of them, and I don't know, and I don't know any geologist who knows, where did they get that rock? It's in the Farmington Valley someplace. We don't know where it was, the native people. Um, this, this was painted during the Depression in the Norwalk High School cafeteria. And it's called the Plants and Animals, uh, the, uh, or is it just the animals of Connecticut? You see this cutout? That's where the door was for the cafeteria. So an artist was hired during the Depression to paint around the door. Oh. And so you've got, obviously, there's deer and fox and skunk and raccoons and bears and all manner of birds. What, what this artist was attempting to do is to present us with, these are, this is the wildlife. These are the wildlife resources available in Aboriginal Connecticut. Well, we find the bones of some of these critters, and we find the remnants of some of these, these animals in our archaeological sites. Certainly, native people were reliant on these animals and plants, um, and at least since the, 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 the last um, uh, glaciation, the last deglaciation, the animals living in Connecticut are more or less the same as we see today. And geese, and uh, coyotes and porcupines. These are all photographs that I've taken in the farming mill. So these are all animals that I've encountered. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> we were talking about bears before. Um, that's not the, the original look of the bear from years ago, but we got more bling now. And of course, deer. Maybe the most significant because you've got uh, a lot of meat on a deer, you've got the deer hide for the males, you have the antlers. Those, these are all important elements of the animal that provides uh, human beings with resources for eating, for dressing, and for making tools. Um, one of the things that we do, along with looking at the environment in Farming Valley, is, I haven't done this in a while, is we used to send out questionnaires to people thinking, hey, listen, I'm new to the valley. There are people who have been farming here for forever, people who put in tomato gardens or put in a swimming pool or put in a deck. They dig holes in the ground, and when you dig holes in the ground, if there are artifacts, if there are... I'm, I'm, I'm going to use that word artifact, and then I'm going to tell you about a funny story that happens to me, right? Uh, artifacts, meaning spear points and pieces of pottery and whatever, um, that people moving soil are likely to find those or encounter those. So we send out questionnaires to people. Um, one year, and I'm not going to name any names, but a landowner, property owner, um, who owned a substantial amount of land in Avon, didn't send back the questionnaire. We sent it with a you know, self-addressed stamp, stamp envelope. And um, I didn't ask them why I didn't. I called them. I know he was a busy man, maybe didn't have time to fill it out, and said, yeah, no problem. He was very nice to me on the phone, very generous. He said, uh, look, Ken, we have never found any artifacts here. And that's exactly what the, the questionnaire asked. Have you ever found any artifacts? 
So no, 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 no artifacts here. Not, not here in Avon, no, of course not. So well, that's interesting. Your neighbors to the north and south have said they did find some artifacts. Quiet on the phone. Because you're kidding. I said, no, 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 there are, you, they said they found artifacts. He goes, oh, that's, that's amazing. Well, we've never found any artifacts here. And I've been plowing this land for decades. Okay, so it was, I was cool. Um, maybe he just didn't find anything or wasn't aware. So we're about to hang up on the phone, and as it gets to that awkward moment when you're not sure if the person's gonna hang up first, and I hear this thin voice on the other end of the line, it's him saying, yeah, hundreds of arrowheads, though. <laughs> and I said, whoa, wait, excuse me, what? And he said, yeah, okay. arrowheads all the time, but we don't have any artifacts. <laughs> Honest to goodness, I said, um, well, when, we, when I say artifacts in the questionnaire, I mean, you know, like arrowheads. And he said, why didn't you say so? I thought you meant pyramids and mummies. <laughs> so, it is not my expecta expectation that anybody plowing the North 40 in Avon, the tops of those pyramids are getting away the plow blade. <laughs> no, that's my fault, my bad. That's right. Yeah, because, you know, artifact means something to me. It might mean something else entirely. So from now on, the questionnaires always say, have you ever any artifacts? You know, arrowheads or pottery or bone tools. And we've gotten tremendous response. Here's what I'll tell you about the Farming Valley. Other archaeologists in Connecticut who use this technique tell me that they get about a 10% response. So 10% of the people, 1 in 10, actually sends the questionnaire back. Typically in the Farmington Valley, I got a 50% response. Wow. And now a lot of those are people who say, well, I've never found anything, but I'm really interested. You know, will you let us know what you find? And people who found stuff have it in their garage or in their basements, and generously allowed me to look at these things, photograph these things. It's been amazing. And when I tell people, other oh, archaeologists, oh, from the valley, I got like a 50% response rate. They don't believe me. They know that's not possible. We get 10% if we're lucky. I think that just shows that people around here are maybe a little, you know, more interested in in putting their own modern lives in the context of people who've been living here for thousands of years, thousands of years ago. Anyway. So these are, these are the kinds of things people show me that they've been collecting for years and years and years, putting them in a cigar box, putting them in a shoe box, not knowing what to do with them, not knowing how old they are, and then graciously inviting me into their homes to look at the artifacts that they're finding. This, these are right across the street from the high school in Avon. Avon High. It's just, there are those older houses. You know, somebody, every year they plant their tomatoes. Those things come out of the ground. What's the white stone? The white stone, yeah. these over here, yeah. that's quartz. Oh. And let me tell you something. I teach a class in making stone tools, and I have infinite respect for anybody who can make a stone tool out of quartz. Mm -hmm. And some of the, the native people here, it was amazing, and I don't know how they did it. I mean, I can't, I can't replicate it. It's very, very difficult stone. Flint is, is much, much easier, uh, but Flint's not around here. It's the... the, the um, uh, Hudson Valley, New York State. Hornfells is a rock type that, until I came to the Farming Valley, I never I never heard about. It's metam there won't be a test, by the way. It's, just, <laughs> it's metamorphosed sandstone. Oh. It's sandstone that's been baked when the igneous rock, when the basalt was molten and flowed over the sandstone. It heated it up to a high temperature and made it more glass-like. Mm -hmm. And it looks a lot like flint, but it's not. And here's where I love teaching because you can really disgust undergraduates so easily. <laughs> Flint is so dense that it doesn't absorb any moisture at all. Hornfells is not nearly as dense and is absorbent. They look almost the same sometimes, so the way you tell the difference is you lick the rock. <laughs> oh, isn't that fun? You know, you're out there in the field, and someone's like, is this Hornfells or Flint? I don't know. Let me see. <laughs> and you look at it. And you go, oh! And you go, ah, that's Hornfels. If your tongue sticks, it's Hornfels. <laughs> that's the little fun fact. These are all in Granby. These are because styles change through time, and we have a very large database of different styles. I can tell you, these are all called Lavana points, and they they all date to within five to maybe eight hundred years ago. So they're relatively recent, and those are in fact arrow points. Some of these, this one here with this kind of, that's broken. Right? The tip, this is from Granby. This is, the tip is broken here, over here, but you've got this kind of bifurcated point base. 
They, we know that the natives only made that point type with that base seven to 8,000 years ago. So that is a, that's really ancient. This is more like 500 years. These, are, these shiny ones are flint, which they traded for. And these others are other materials that it's hard to, for me to tell you in this photograph what they are. Um, when we do the Farmington River canoe trip, and I love doing that trip, at least for years, we, we put the canoe, we, we gathered at Alsop Meadow. And then John would drive us, we'd put in and we'd come out at Alsop Meadow. And I thought it was ironic that here's the archaeological canoe trip, and we all gathered at a place that's maybe a one minute walk from a 5,000 year old archaeological site. Uh, back behind where we used to, to gather, there is a big open field owned by the town of Avon, and we excavated there in the early 1980s and found a 5,000-year-old site. Here are two people. Um, I don't know if anybody here is old enough to remember, um, what was her name? The woman who was the, like the town select person in Avon, Murdoch? Does that ring a bell? Uh, that's her daughter, that's Dory, who, by the way, died like a couple of years ago. But she was a brilliant young woman, and she came and dug with, dug with us, with us, and I, I kept track of her for years and years and years. So that's right. And this is Alsop Meadow. So this is just this big open field. Nobody ever found any artifacts there before. We dug test pits and found all manner of stuff. Now the cool thing is, you dug down about a foot and a half, and there's nothing. The soil was absolutely clean, not a stone in it. And you came down to one level, and that level was littered with thousands of pieces of rock and things like this, which we didn't find at all in the upper levels. Now that doesn't look like much. They're broken pieces of stone from people making spear points that look like that. That is, in fact, a basalt spear point. Look at this. This is beautiful. Oh. Any tool that you would need to, to use made out of steel today, these folks were making out of stone. That's a drill. So that would have been hafted onto a shaft, and by turning it back and forth and back and forth, this narrow bit would drill a hole in wood or in bone or even in stone. We have stone objects that have drilled holes in them that are thousands of years old. Amulets, the things that suspend uh, around the <coughs> so that's And that's, that is not life size. It's really only about that big. But that's an amazing piece of craftsmanship. Uh, that's the same artifact, but in a lab shot. This is. Occasionally we have television crews who come out and do like human interest stories about our digs. And the year that we had somebody come out from, I think it was NBC, the NBC affiliate, and this woman, she wasn't really impressed by the archaeology of the Farmington Valley. She wanted, I don't know, maybe she wanted those pyramids and mummies. And I showed her these two pieces of the same spear point that we found in different places of the site. And I thought it was pretty cool you could put them together. And what she said to me on camera was, well, Ken, there's really not that much you can learn about these people that you know about them. You don't know their names, you don't know their tribal names. And I interrupted her and said, I gotta, this spear point right here was broken while it was being made. The very last step, it snapped. So I have a pretty good idea what the guy said <laughs> when that happened. And she didn't want to hear what I had. <laughs> this is horn fowls. This is a work of art. It is gorgeous. Um, uh, scale here, that's so two and a half of these is an inch. So you're looking at something that's only about that big. It is, that's 5,000 years old. If you have to this on a shaft today, 5,000 years later, and if you shot it at an animal, you would kill the animal. It's still that sharp. It, it, it genuinely is sharp. So these are spectacular pieces of art, but also these are entirely functional. 5,000 years ago um, in Alsop Meadow. Now, Old Farms Brook in Avon, you know where Old Farms Brook feeds right into the Farmington River. This is in Avon, it's right south of Fisher Meadow. Um, we're excavating there, and you see the, the modeling of the soil? It's a little dark there, right? So as we're moving it, we wonder, what's that? Why is it dark like that? It could be organic material, meaning that some could be, stone, could be uh, wood, it could be bone that's burned. And as we remove the soil, Mixed in all that modeling, we find stones. Now, there are no stones anywhere here. It's right where the stream flows into the Farmington. It's clean, clean alluvium, clean silt. And we start seeing a bed of rocks. Now, all of those rocks have been in a fire. 
So they're all burned, they're, some of them are, are cracked, and they're all reddened. And as we expand this, it gets larger and larger until we've got about four feet by five feet, a platform of stones, and mixed into the soil under the stones, there's charcoal, and there are little tiny bits of bone. And we continue. Now you see, this is my, my directional arrow. And there's something right there at exactly the same level as the platform. The platform, by the way, the charcoal from the platform sent off to a lab 4,250 years ago. So it's a long time ago. And you see that's a seven, that's seven and a half inches. You see that little piece of stone right there? It's that. So now here's the thing. The bone from that platform of stones was deer bone. We've got the smoking gun of something that happened 4,250 years ago. That's the weapon. By the way, that weapon, that spear point, was imperfect. The tip was broken. In all likelihood, what that means is that's the spear point that killed the deer. The tip hit a bone in the deer and broke off. We did not recover that. The spear was then thrown aside because, well, it's broken now. The deer is butchered, and that... That's, in fact, it's like your grill. It's a platform. The fire is underneath. The, f the stones get hot. The fire licks up between the stones, and you put pieces of the deer on that to cook, to, 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 to cook that deer. Um, and it's, I think that's one of the most interesting things you can do in archaeology is to be able to reconstruct a moment frozen in time just by, it's like being a detective. We, detectives um, investigate the scene of a crime. We investigate the scene of a life. This is in Bark Hampstead, also not that far from the Farmington River. It's the Woodlily site. Remember that drill I showed you before? This thing is gigantic. Whoever made that was showing off. <laughs> That's the all. I mean, there's no way you needed to make it that long. It's beautiful. And you'll notice there are four other pieces of, of drill. So this is uh, this site's 3,000 years old. These are spear point fragments from that same site. That, that's quartz, and that's another kind of quartz. Some of the quartz we have around here is almost clear, that it, it's crystalline, and um, that's beautiful stuff. These are all quartz, and these are knives. Again, every tool that you would need out of steel, these folks were making out of stone. This is Andrea Rand. Andrea lives in Canton, and she's been um, a, a colleague of mine for years and years and years. Several years back, she was hiking through People's State Forest with Walter Landgraf. And everybody knows Walter in the valley, at least in the west part of the valley. Great man, was a teacher, high school teacher, became kind of the, a, a volunteer for the D, what was then the DEP, revived the, you know, the Stone Museum in People's Forest, and was a historian, and an arch, he, did, he did archaeology with me, to, uh, an environmentalist, a really great guy. He and Andrew were walking through the woods, in Barkhamstead, in People's Forest, and they came upon these stones sticking up out of the ground. Let me go back one. See that stone right there? The only thing that was significant about it is it's soapstone, or steatite, which is a soft rock that we know available only in, in discrete, discrete places, but that natives exploited that stone because you could carve it. It was a soft stone, um, great heat retention, um, it, you, thermal shock, doesn't exist for soapstone. They make wood stoves with soapstone panels today. Um, Vermont Castings, I think, makes a, a, a line of them. And I, I have one of those. They're great. They really retain the heat well. Well, there is raw native soapstone in a couple of discrete locations in Connecticut. Wherever it was, Native Americans found it, they quarried it, they carved it into bowls, and it was very important before pottery came into this area, which is about 3,000 years ago. So before pottery, if you had access to soapstone, you had a valuable, rare, and precious raw material that was of great value. So this is my crew. When we got to the site in 2011, we didn't know what we would find. There were just these two rocks sticking up out of the ground. What, what would we, what ultimately, what was that going to look like? And you start seeing this. These are, we found quartz and quartzite tools, which are the tools used for carving soapstone. Soapstone has a hardness on the, uh, 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 the Mohs hardness scale. It's about a two. Quartzite is a seven. Quartzite's a lot harder, so you can carve the stone with another stone. Now remember, this is what it looked like 
when Walter and Andrea got there in like the late 90s. So you see that one little boulder here, one little boulder here, one little boulder here. By the time we're done, whoa, that's what you're looking at. That entire chunk of soapstone is carved all over the place. It was used again and again and again to remove soapstone bowls. That's a preform. That we call them unharvested bowl forms. So there's one here and one there. This is from the air. So there's an, un an unharvested bowl there, 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 and there. And that thing would have been heavy. They, that's a lot of work drilling those things out. This is a, another shot of it, maybe a better shot. And um, when people ask me, well, what happened? Why did they abandon the site? This site is abandoned almost exactly the same time that pottery comes into the area. So it's, um, there's an economist who calls something like that um, disruptive innovation. Right? So it's an innovation that just completely disrupts everything. It's like, like a microchip. Suddenly everything changes. Every, the automobile, everything changes. Where before you had to live pretty close to where you worked every day with the automobile, that's no longer the case. It changes the face of America. This changed the face of Connecticut. When pottery came in, and these guys are working dutifully on this rare, rare resource, they live there, it's theirs, and somebody walks in with a, a bowl made of clay and says, that stuff is no, of no value. We all have clay in our backyards, we don't need soapstone. And that's, the, soap, this, the quarry is abandoned at that time, and we see the use of soapstone go down to very, very low levels. It picks up again in the historic period when soapstone slabs are being used as bed warmers by the colonists. So uh, this is an artist's conception of somebody <laughs> actually carving out one of the soapstone bowls. And that is a soapstone bowl that we found. It's broken, but there's the lug. That's the handle of it. You see the curve of the top. And the thing is about this big. And it's heavy, but um, it must have broken while they were carving it, and so they abandoned it, just threw it in the garbage. And that's, that's archaeologists are all about garbage. We like garbage. <laughs> we like people to leave a mess. The Walt Landgraf Soapstone Quarry is, um, has been named as, it's been honored as a state archaeological preserve. There are about 35, 36 of them in the state of Connecticut. We have, in the Farmington Valley, I think we have three of them, which is for the entire state. That's a lot when you only have 35, 36 of them all together. So this is, there's a booklet. If you're interested in more about the Soapstone Quarry, the booklets are available at the Park Hampstead Historical Society. Like, you have five bucks, I'll give you a book. It's 24 pages, beautiful. Um, talking about some more sites in the Farmington Valley, a lot of you probably are familiar with the Lighthouse site, the poem written by Lewis Mills in 1952. We, the, the historical archaeology, archaeology of the period during which there's writing, is a, a different game than prehistoric archaeology, which is what I'm used to. We have written records. We have the names of the people who lived at this village late Middle, middle 18th century through the middle of the 19th century. This, you can't read it, but I'll show you a close-up of it. Um, this is one of my favorite documents that I ever found. This is our Campstead Town Hall. It's the birth and death birth records. This is a page of birth records. So the first column is the date. The next column is the name of the baby. And you see that a lot of them, that there are no names because the new babies hadn't been named yet. Then the sex of the baby. So you see female, female, male, female, male. The names of the parents, the ages of the parents. Color. The, the, the town clerk was supposed to look at the baby and decide whether it was white or black or Indian. And then the last column is the place of residence. What's super cool is on May 14th, a little girl was born, Solomon Webster, who I know is a Mohegan Indian. Mary, who is a descendant of the founders of the community, James Chagam and Mary Barber, a Narragansett Indian and a white woman. And you notice the last column? Officially recognized as a community, Bar Campstead Lighthouse. So that's real. And can you read the color of the child? Nearly white. <laughs> you know, there's so much stuff in modern America about racial tensions and what are you? You're mixed race. And here, the town clerk in Bar Campstead in 1858 is looking at a baby going, I don't know, uh, not really white, not a black child, not Indian. I'll say nearly white. So next time you fill out your census, say, I, they ask you what color you are. I, go, I don't know. Come, come take the Pittsburgh paint chart and look at my skin. Tell me what I am. 
But the thing, the place is called the Lighthouse because the stagecoach driver is driving by who had no, no uh, uh, they didn't have GPS and they didn't have maps, they had no landmarks, when they came upon this village in the middle of Park Hampstead, hard fast against the Farmington River, they would say, there's our lighthouse five miles till Port, and Port was New Hartford, where there was an inn where they could water their horses and rest. Um, archaeological site. The most important thing I want to talk about with the lighthouse, though, this is a foundation that probably had a, a, a structure like that. We have, we have reports by newspaper, by journalists, who wrote about this place in the middle of the 19th century. Um, this one guy called the, the houses of the people of the lighthouse midway between a wood pile and a log fence. <laughs> he was, I guess he was an architectural critic. <laughs> but we have this. This is a quarry. These, are, these stones belong together. You can see the quarry marks. And there's our little elf quarry in the stone. Um, there are charcoal furnaces. The, the natives who lived at the lighthouse site made money, this is in the early 19th century, to feed the iron furnaces in western Connecticut. They made charcoal. Pile up wood, burn it down until the moisture is gone. It's light, highly dense energy source for the iron furnaces. And very dangerous, very dirty job. And for the most part, it fell to people like Native Americans or black folks, and then Italian immigrants, and then Irish immigrants. Whoever was poor and newly arrived in this country, well, you can always make charcoal because it's dangerous and dirty and nobody else wanted to do it. And, uh, and Lewis Mills talks about the grinding stone, and we, it's right there, easily found, and the cemetery. Now, here's the thing. So I'm doing this field work. And we're on TV, occasionally we're on TV, and this gentleman here pulls up to, we're stopped for lunch, we're on the side of the road, this is an East River Road in Park Hampstead, we are right up against the Farmington River, and that's uh, Mr. Raymond Ellis. He gets out of the pickup truck, I'm sitting down, and Mr. Ellis thrusts out his hand, and he's a lot bigger than I am, and, he's, and I stand up and he says, shake my hand. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and he points up to the the hill. And he says, you just shook hands with one of them. I'm a descendant. And he called him Jimmy Chago. I was blown away by it. He took me up. I took him up. He had never been to the site. And he had never been to the site because he said to me, well, around here, it's kind of not a point of pride to be a descendant of those drunken Indians. That's what everybody says. So he had hidden the fact that he was a Native American, partially Native American. So I brought him up, and I, I put on my professor hat, and I'm lecturing about all the sites. And we got to the cemetery, and I'm still, because I'm an idiot, I'm lecturing. I'm doing this dry lecture about the cemetery, and I look up at this bear of a man. He's crying. And I thought I had offended. I said, oh, I'm sorry. What did I say? And he said, no, no, don't be sorry. Thank you for bringing me home. Oh, my God, right? Now, here's the, the best part, is that Mr. Ellis was the first of dozens of descendants of the people who lived on that hill in Bar Campstead, who were a mixture of Native American, African American, and Euro American, and that Lewis Mills, who writes the poem, talks about the generation speeding out onward in an ever widening circle. Absolutely true. And now the descendants, it's also a state archaeological preserve. The people in the background are all descendants of the Lighthouse Tribe. The Farmington River Coordinating Committee provided us with money to put signage up at the site. The woman doing the reveal is Connie Dubois, who is a ninth generation descendant of James Chago. She lives in, not in New Orleans, but a town north of New Orleans. And her father, she grew up in Indiana. Her father told her, we are descendants of an Indian tribe in Connecticut. He didn't know anything else about it. Mm -hmm. Connie contacted me. She is now... The, the family genealogist, she's got a Facebook page, and what Connie did, this, these are all, there are people in this who look like Native Americans, there are people in here who look white, people who look something in between, there are, there are folks in the, in the family who are very, very dark skinned, who look like they are African American, and they are, but they're also white and they're also Indian, and there was, um, July 4th in 2015, there was a reunion. The family showed up. I got to show them the cemetery. I got to give them the tour like I gave Mr. Ellis. And 
So they're, and they're the guests of honor in the July 4th parade, the whole family. And they all have their red shirts on. And I met with Connie before. I said, Connie, I want to get a really good place to, to march. To, you guys are marching. I want to get a good place to get pictures. He says, well, come to the staging area. I want, I want you to meet some people. So I did that. And we're, we're all talking. I said, Connie, I really want to get a good spot. She goes, no, no, no. You don't have to watch the parade. You're going to be in the parade. And I said, what are you talking about? And she goes, well, you're going to march with us. I said, Connie, this is for family. And she said, well, Kenny, you are family now. And it was like, oh my god. And there I am. <laughs> you, can't, you can't miss the hair anyway. But there I am with the members of the family. And this is like, this was my Norman Rockwell moment. But Norman Rockwell, 21st century. It's Indians and black folks and white folks, and we're all part of the same family. And the, the fact that the family understood that, you know what you're doing, Fader, is helping us regain our story. And that kind of is where I go into the next part here. Uh, because what I did, this 50 Sites book, what I'm doing is in fact trying to tell people in America, we've got a vast and fascinating history here in this country that doesn't start with Columbus and it doesn't start with the Vikings but goes back a lot further and we're all American so it's all part of our story. Now, the reason I'm showing you this, we in New England are very proud of the fact that our towns are old, that, that they're established a long time ago and every town has its sign, right? Yeah. Welcome to Farmington, incorporated 1645 and we go around, you know, going, we're bad, you know, <laughs> we are older than anybody. So I'm in Bluff, Utah. The natives, that's mostly Navajo, they are self-aware. Uh, <laughs> Bluff, Utah, it's after 650 AD. So, okay, you Puritans in Connecticut, can you match that? <laughs> no, we really can't. Um, Bluff is a lovely town I want to come back to. It. Bluff is in the southeastern corner of the Be Bears Ears National Monument. That's the one that there's some things of controversy about, and I'll give you my... Un solicited political <laughs> opinion after that. So I have been, that's my book, Ancient America. Uh, I think Sally asked if I had copies that I could sell. I, I don't. I have, if anybody, please don't feel obliged. I have um, these um, flyers that get you like a 30% discount if you buy it directly from the publisher. So if you're interested, I've got them. No, no stress, no pressure at all. Um, but it's but they make wonderful presents. I just <laughs> 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 all right. so oh oh, oh wait, wait go back one. So the the thing that started me on this project is I got a a, a letter from a student, um, and maybe it was it had to be two thousand eight, and it was one of those letters that I occasionally get. Dear Dr. Fager, you won't remember me. I didn't, uh, and I wasn't a really good student. I checked. He was being honest. He said, well, I took your class four years ago, 2004. And I really, I, you know, I, it was a great class. I was just not a, student, a good student then. And, but I really loved the pictures you showed of the, of the archaeological sites that you've been to. So this is before this was even a thought in my mind of writing a book about it. And he says to me, this is so, remember, so it's 2008. He took my class in 2004. So it's four years later. He's tracked me down. He said, well, Dr. Fair, I just want you to know that I'm married now and I have two children, a three-year-old and a, you know, a less than one-year-old. And we were traveling in Arizona, going up the I-17 from Phoenix to Grand Canyon, and while we are driving, we pass a sign that says Montezuma's Castle. Now, of course, I had to point out to him that it's not Montezuma's Castle, no apostrophe S, it's just Montezuma Castle, but I'm a college prophet and I'm allowed to do that. So he says, we passed the sign from Montezuma's Castle, and I, I turned to my wife, this is him talking, and I said, remember that crazy archaeology professor I told you about? He showed a picture of that place. It looked really cool. It's like a castle. Do you mind if we pull off and see it? It's a real easy hike. I remember him saying it was a pretty easy hike. And his, he said, my wife said, fine, get the kids out. Three-year-old can run around. The less than one-year-old is in the stroller. She won't, you know, she'll have good, you know, get some fresh air. And then the rest of the letter is him saying, Dr. Fader, you really turned me on to something I didn't even know existed. And that made me feel really good. I mean, I'm not making a little archaeologist very often, but if I can turn somebody on to the vast and impressive archaeological history of our country, and they actually go and go out of their way to see some of it, this is, you see this, this hole in the cliff right there? Well, when you walk along this path to right under it, that's what you're looking up at. 
And it's a 17-room Pueblo. It's about 1,000 years old. Um, at, at about 90 feet off the, the bottom of that cliff. So, uh, the, uh, from the bottom, yeah. So, and then he tells me, oh, my, my wife loved it. I, was, I loved it. My little one, well, you know, she was in the circle. She had a good time. My three-year-old, when we got back to the car, my three-year-old turns to me and said, Daddy, when I grow up, I want to be an archaeologist. <laughs> <laughs> so here I am as a college prof. I'm not thinking I'm even affecting one generation, the generation of my class. I've got multi-generational impact. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I'm saying. It's just an amazing place. This is one of the 50 sites in the book. Now, that, that's what inspired me. It's this guy saying, you know, we want to know more about these. So I did. I had already seen some of the sites. Went on this 50 sites odyssey over like years and years and years. And in 2016, November, the book actually came out. And I'm incredibly pleased with it. It's been so great fun. It's been really well reviewed. Yes, a lot of them are here, and a lot of them are here. I'm doing a book two, which is kind of a little bit of, a, of an off-kilter version of the 50 Sites book. And there are a lot more in New England than elsewhere. So Southwest, Northwest, here in the American Midwest and Southeast, lots and lots of sites. And it's really hard to read. All right, this is a map, 1784, of the United States. You can't read this, but what it says right in this narrow band? Connecticut. That's the Northwestern Territories of Connecticut. The end of the Revolutionary War, uh, in order to, to give benefits to Revolutionary War veterans, land was offered to these folks living in Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island. Go west, young man. That was the go west, young man. It wasn't Nevada. It was Ohio. And that, this land was made available to folks um, living in, in New England, uh, if you were a, a Revolutionary War veteran, go out there and get some free land. And they moved out in great numbers. And one of the towns they moved out to was Marietta, Ohio. And the, here's what they found in Marietta, Ohio. A conical mound, they dug into the top, and they found Native American skeletons. Now, what's really interesting, and these are folks from Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. In many other parts of the country, when those were found, the, the graves were defiled, the bones were thrown away, and the artifacts were kept. And then the mound was bulldozed. These folks did not do that. Obviously, it's still there. Interestingly, what they said was, and this is, we know this is exactly what happened. They said, this is sacred, gra sacred ground to the ancient people who lived here. We are going to maintain it as sacred ground and use it the same way they did. This is an artist's conception. This is in the early 1800s. There's the conus, the burial mound that's 2,000 years old, and in the foreground, they put their own cemetery. When you go there today, it's open to the public. It's called the Mound Cemetery. You can see the mound in the background. That's 2,000 years old. In, uh, to the memory of Elizabeth Minor, native of Newport, Rhode Island, the, the um, Earn the urn, the willow design, the weeping willow design, which is super common. Go to the cemetery right here in town. You see that all over the place. Common in New England, it's in Ohio because those people were New Englanders. Look at this guy, Seth Hart. He was born in Berlin, Connecticut, November 13, 1804. Family moved out here. He died in 1881. And this is what that cemetery looks like. It's really impressive that you've got these two different cultures, two different time periods, treating this as sacred ground in which their dead are buried. It's one of my 50 sites. You can visit it. It's free. You park in the neighborhood, cross the street, and you're in the middle of a 2,000-year-old cemetery and a 200-year-old cemetery. Cahokia Mound State Park in Illinois. Um, Cahokia, it was a Native American city that dates to at its peak around between 1200 and maybe 1400 AD. Population of between 10 and 30,000 people. 200 mounds, including Monk's Mound, which is by volume the fifth largest pyramid in the world. That includes the Egyptian pyramids. This is an aerial photo of it. The chief's house, the, the leader's house, was on top of Monk's Mound. This is in the museum. They have a great museum there. This is the Pyramid of the Moon or Pyramid of the Sun in Teotihuacan outside of Mexico City. This is the Pyramid of the Feathered Serpent, a Mayan pyramid at Chichen Itza. 
This is Monk's Mound, the Mound of Cahokia, and this is Khufu's Pyramid at, um, in, in um, Giza. So yeah, this is a lot bigger, but the footprint there is almost as big as that, made entirely of earth. Um, it's an amazing site. This is an artist's conception, the central part of the city. That is a palisade of 20,000 logs that enclosed, encased the, um, the, 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 the central part of the city where the more important people lived. And the artwork there is just astonishing. It's a little piece, but the carved faces. This is uh, a sculpture of an, a woman nursing a baby. This is fine art, ancient art. And see right there, that guy in blue? They dug him up, and he was in his mid-40s, surrounded by dozens and dozens and dozens of other burials. And most of those other people um, were sacrificed. They were killed to accompany this guy to the afterlife. Um, this pit right here, there are, I believe, 56. All of them are women, and all between the ages of 16 and 24. Um, his wives, his servants, that's impossible to say. That you, you think about that, this is a, a, a wax dummy um, replicating him. These are 20,000 shell beads. The shell all came from the Gulf Coast. Um, these are spear points, some of them made of obsidian that had to come from Wyoming. There is a gigantic trading network with Cahokia as the central place where raw materials come in there and it ends up in the graves of the elites, the one percenters. That's not a new thing. <laughs> Further west, Canyon de Chez, and then we get back to the, the whole idea that, that, that the work that I'm doing, the, the purpose of it, one of the purposes is to give people back the history of, of America that too often is ignored um, in books. When I ask my students, what do they hear about Native America in their social studies classes, for the most part they say, well we know that there were Indians here and then pilgrims. So that first paragraph is about Indians and then the pilgrims are here and there's not the stuff that I talk about in my classes is, a re is revelatory, and it shouldn't be. This is stuff that the history of America, and we're all Americans. Kandashe is in Arizona. It's on the Navajo Reservation, but it has sites that are both Navajo and ancient Hopi. And so you've got these beautiful, amazing cliff dwellings. But the story I want to tell at Canyon de Shea is this one here. This is called Massacre Cave. And the Navajo tell the story. The Navajo lived there. This is in the... Um, the 18th, 18th century. And the Spanish wanted Canyon de Chez for themselves, had fresh water running through it, really good agricultural land, great places to graze horses and cattle. And so they fought a war against the Navajo. The, the Spanish drew the Navajo soldiers or braves out to another part of the canyon to fight. The, the Spanish left behind a contingent who hunted down more than 100 women and children and slaughtered them in 1805. And that's called Massacre Cave. It's a story handed down by the Navajo from generation to generation. Let us never forget what happened to us. But the interesting part of the story is, and I was told this by a Navajo who gave me a tour of and just, uh, Harris, Harris Hardy, great guy, who, by the way, Harris told me that, that when he was a kid growing up, and he's got to be in his 40s, when he was a kid growing up, all the other Navajo kids made fun of him because his grandmother wanted him to learn perfect English. And they said, why? Well, you, you know, we don't have to deal with, with white folks. You just need to, know, to learn Navajo. And his grandmother said, Harris, you are an ambassador of our people. And when white people come here to look at the remains of, of Chikai de Che, you need to tell them our story. We don't need other people telling our story. We need you to tell the story. And she told Harris the story of what happened in Massacre Cave. A young boy was in Massacre Cave with his mother, and his aunts, and his grandmothers. And they all died, but they made sure that he lived by burying his body, by burying him in their bodies. The Spanish came down, checked. They thought no one was alive, and they left. The little boy escaped, found a Navajo, a Navajo family outside of the valley, and grew up. And when he returned, he painted this. There's Spaniards on horseback. Do you see the cross? Because what the Navajo say is that the Spanish soldiers always brought priests with them to sanctify what they did. And so the Navajo, the Navajo say today that the priests gave the okay to the soldiers to slaughter the men and women in the cave. 
and they don't want people to forget that story. And that's this painting of these are men with rifles, with Spanish hats, on horseback. Some of them are priests. Um, and what they're doing is they're leaving the canyon after they slaughtered the women children. Occasionally, when I, in my, my tour, I happen on places completely by accident. This is um, uh, land controlled by the Bureau of Land Management, Three Rivers Petroglyph Site and Picnic Area. And I stop and say, oh, petroglyphs. This is the most spectacular petroglyph site in the entire Southwest. <laughs> it is amazing. A lot of bighorn sheep. Woolly bighorn sheep. These are at least 800 years old. This is my favorite. That is a bighorn sheep with one, two, three arrows piercing its body, showing that. <clears throat> this really interesting. That and he's about that big. This is an image of the god Tlaloc, who was an Aztec god. What is Tlaloc doing? in southern New Mexico. It's contact between the Southwest and Mexico. We know that when the ne ancient Mexicans made their turquoise artifacts, they have a lot of them, there's no turquoise in Mexico. They had to get the turquoise from the Southwest. New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, and Southern California. When I was an undergraduate student, that's a long time ago, my professor was working on this, and we would go every day into the lab, and we would drill pieces of turquoise and take that sample and put it in a nuclear reactor to trace its, the, the, its elemental composition. And I read an article a few years ago in an archaeology journal that, yep, they're able to trace these artifacts that this guy, Phil Weigand, who has since passed away, trace them to individual caves in New Mexico and Nevada and California where the turquoise was, was gathered. Even though the turquoise looks the same, its co chemical composition is different. And Strange bird. That is a rain cloud image among the Hopi. So it's a, this is some kind of a god that is living in the rain clouds. That's another bird. See this animal here? I have no idea what this is. <laughs> what is that? It's not a cow because it's too old for cows. Um, I, I don't know. Um, this is not. The United States, right? Yeah. This is Nazca. You probably uh, in the ancient alien show they talk about this all the time. Oh yeah, it's aliens who did this. This is in South America, right? They're called Intalians. We have these in America, in Southern California. They're the blithe Intalios, right close up to the Arizona border in Southern California. That's 180 feet from here to the top of this head, 120 feet across. Talk about serendipity. So I'm at the Blythe and Talios, and I'm taking, I can't take good pictures of him because you've got to be way up in the air. As I'm leaving, a woman and her husband start walking up, and I see she's got a drone. Oh, <laughs> and I go, hi, who are you? And her name is uh, Desiree Eckstein, and her husband's name is Ken. All right, I like that. And she goes, yeah, she has a business, a drone business. She does a lot of photography. And on their days off, they like driving around and finding really cool archaeological sites to photograph. I said, Oh, you know, I happen to be writing a book about the archaeological site. She has been in, a real friend. She has, she, number one, she and Ken have directed me to other sites where there are these large scale line drawings, and she supplied me photographs that I've put in a couple of books now. That's her image from her drone, as is this one. Um, it can't be a horse. Because these things are about a thousand years old, and there are no horses in North America before this. Uh, there are ten thousand years ago; they've become extinct. Spanish reintroduced them in the 15th century, so we're not sure what they are. By the way, the, this guy, the native people, um, the Indians in that area, they'll tell you what that is. And I can't pronounce it, but that's a, a spirit god who lives in the sky. And they say their ancestors did that on a big scale because that way the god who lived in the sky can see his own image. And some of the natives say well, that's, there's another one, some of the natives say that's a cougar. Uh, it doesn't look like a cougar to me, but you know, who do well, I know? And this is just a spiral, which is a typical, a typical image um, in, the, in the southwest. Canyonlands National Park, spectacular place, and this is Horseshoe Canyon. I'm walking down into Horseshoe Canyon, it's about an 800 foot drop. And you see off in the distance, you see there are some images there in this alcove? 
It's oh, this. Wow. Those are pictographs. See this guy right here? He's seven feet tall. So he's from the bottom. He's 15 feet up off the surface, and from here to here, he's about seven feet. There are more than two dozen of these spirit images, and these are 2,000 years old, perfectly preserved because of their location in an alcove, and it just doesn't rain a lot here. Um, the cool thing about this, and it was something I noticed, and I asked the, the ranger who was there. Um, I was with a couple, a couple people, and we were talking. You know, you hike, you're laughing, you're talking, you're joking. We got here. Everything just got quiet. Just whispering. <laughs> and I'm not even sure why. Just it seemed the right thing to do, that it was rude to be loud. And I said, isn't that funny how we started whispering? And he goes, everybody. No. Everybody arrives, and they're not, this is not their religion, they're not Native Americans, most of the people visiting, but it's, you're in the presence of something that just seems, it's like a beautiful sunset, or a vista on a, on a, 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 a waterfall, or the Sistine Chapel, where you just, you know you're in the presence of something powerful, spiritually, no matter what your beliefs are, or lack of beliefs, it just moves you, and this was an amazing place. And you can see more of these guys all throughout that cave. All right. Now, here's the thing, right? So fairly recently, the, one of the last acts of President Obama was to name Bears Ears National Monument. It's our most, recent, most recently named National Monument. <laughs> um, and I know there's been a lot of controversy about it. Just to clear up some things, the, uh, you may hear that this was forced through at the end. This has been in the works for 80 years. It, it truly has been. And I've got a quote. I want to show you this quote. Fiendish and diabolical scheme. The fate of our state depends exclusively upon the development of her mineral resources. This is not related to Bears Ears National Monument, although it sounds like it could be. This is an actual quote from 1911 or 1912 about the Grand Canyon. All right, the Grand Canyon is iconic internationally. It brings in millions of dollars to the state of Arizona. And when it was named the National <coughs> Monument, people were complaining bitterly about you're stealing our mineral rights. And the more things change, the more they remain the same. <laughs> Um, this is 1.3 million acres, which is scaled back already from the 1.7 million. This area may be, from an archaeologist's perspective, from a geologist's perspective, it's crazy beautiful. From an archaeologist's perspective, it is one of the densest, the densest concentrations of archaeological sites and rock, and rock art in the country. And some of my 50 sites are, I, at the time, they weren't in, there wasn't a Bears Ears National, Bears Ears National Monument when I was there, but they're in there now. And so the, the extra protection afforded is amazing. This is River Ruin, a spectacular set. This is um, of, of, of cliff dwellings. This is Buckler Wash. And it's, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these in that area. This is, these are the bu lower Buckler Wash petroglyphs. These guys are about five feet tall. They are just beautiful with these interesting headdresses. This guy's got a little bighorn sheep carved into his chest. This one's got three. They, they probably are bears. Um, amazing. We have no idea what these things are. But there's a person. There's some kind of a bird. Uh, an interesting kind of cocapelli. The bird image, a spiral. These corn cobs, we were brought in by a Navajo, uh, by a Navajo guy. Those have been sitting there probably for six or seven hundred years. No, there's no decay, there's no corn, there's no food left in them. This is the kind of thing that naming Bears Ears a national monument is working for, work toward preserving. Now, you know, I, I, I do the Farmington River every year. And that's what I'm about capable of doing, you know, that kind of flat water. This is the San Juan, and so we did. Uh, now Eileen's going to laugh at any of the, the farming and river people are going to laugh at me for my naivete. They tell me, oh yeah, just the one concern is eight foot rapids. That's what it's called. And I think, oh, it's only eight feet long. How bad could that be? I'm not eight foot long, it's an eight foot drop. I survived and I'm 
here to tell you about it. So Bears Ears almost got me before it was even Bears Ears. It's, and what, happened, what you do is you tell the Navajo guide what you're interested in, geology, uh, biology. We saw bighorn sheep grazing by the side of the river. We saw rock art all over the place. We saw cliff dwellings. This is the kind of thing that is exactly why the National Monument policy was begun back in 1906. Teddy Roosevelt was the first president, a Republican, was the first president to name national monuments. Um, Montezuma Castle was number three. The first one is Devil's Tower, then um, there's El Moro, which is a big rock face with, with, uh, with ancient, uh, uh, it, it's graffiti, but it's Spanish graffiti from the 16th century. Uh, Bears Ears is the most recent one. And I mean, my next and last, that's in Bears Ears, it's handprints. It's the signatures of the people who lived in this area. Um, the, the, the strongest supporters of the naming of Bears Ears are the Native Americans who live in the area. Um, if you know anything about the Navajo and the Hopi, they, they don't agree about anything. They have, neither one has forgiven the other side for all kinds of stuff that happened in the 1700s. The Navajo and the Hopi, along with the Zuni and the Ute, together formed um, a, a support group for Bears Ears, and they are among the strongest supporters. Some people tell you, well, the natives are hated because they won't be able to do their traditional stuff. That's just simply not true. If that were true, then the natives wouldn't support it so strongly. Um, and I, I think that um, it's one of the most, most significant places that I've been to in my odyssey. Obviously, I can't tell you about all 50 of the sites. Um, but these are places that are worth celebrating, worth preserving, and worth visiting and seeing for yourself. Um, I can show you pictures and I can talk about my experiences there, but if you have the chance, if you have the opportunity, whenever you travel, to include in those travels visits to these places, some of them are extremely easy to get to. Um, not all of them require a dirt, you know, driving on a dirt road, not all require a long hike. The, the um, a Horseshoe Canyon, with those really cool spirit beings, that was a, a, a decent drive on a decent dirt road for about 30 miles, and then a three and a half mile hike in and three and a half miles back out. And they always save the up, the up, you know, the going up for the last part of the hike. <laughs> and I like doing that now when I'm going up and I'm, I'm, I'm stopping, and I see like eight year olds just <laughs> sailing by me. I hate you. I hate you so much. <laughs> uh, but in any event, I, I like to end with that, or well, end with a picture of the book again, because they make lovely presents. And I point that out. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of, this is that, that immediate connection to people who lived in this area a thousand years ago. It's their handprints, right? They put their hand in pigment, they put it on the wall, and it's, in a way, it's, that, that's the beauty of archaeology. If, if it's your ancestors, that's an immediate connection, but even if they're not, this is a way to connect with people who were here a long time before we were, and I think that we owe them the preservation, protection, celebration, and, and, um, and visiting those sites so that you can experience for yourselves, you can engage in antiquity, and there's a picture of my book again, and I think we're allowed to stay in here for 15 more minutes. I would love to answer questions if you've got questions. Yes, sir. Uh, quick question, quick, quick comment. Um, I hike in the superstitions. And in the Tonto, there's a national... Tonto National Monument, yeah, yeah. There's a, pot, a, a hike up to two villages. It's half an hour at best. Fascinating because the handprints of the people 800 years ago are in the mud. The question for you is, is ground a penetrating radar of any value as opposed to digging and hoping to find something? Um, yeah, I took this as you know, and, uh, on, on. Okay. On Friday, <laughs> the last Friday of October... Uh, a, a person who does ground penetrating radar is going to meet us up at the Lighthouse Cemetery. And we're going to try, that, that's a way of, of looking at a, a cemetery without doing any, I'm never going to dig those graves up, and that would be crazy, but we, we might be able to discover something with ground penetrating radar. GPR works, this is a way of, of, it's a remote sensing technique, and it's a way, it works really well in very sandy soil, where the only thing in that soil are artifacts or buried walls, or burials, and so that's it's worked really well. I don't know how well it's going to work in Connecticut. Out there, it can work well again in really sandy soils. But the, the point about the, the handprints, what's incredibly cool is there are handprints in Paleolithic caves in France that date to 30,000 years ago. People have, for tens of thousands of years, a way of saying "I was here" is putting their handprint on the wall, and that's 
it just it blows me away. Indonesia, there are cave paintings, newly discovered, 40,000 years old. One of the themes, hand paint, handprints. So it's it's this universal need for people to leave their mark. Yeah, when you and hike like, up there, you're not allowed to touch lean right. against anything. And here's 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 my, my embarrassing admission. I've never been to Tonto. I intended to go one and we just didn't run out of time. You'll love it. Yeah, oh yeah, no definitely, problem. definitely. Yes. So how big are these hands compared to yours? Um those like were well but you know, I'm I'm six three. And so my hands are really big. <laughs> Come on, I'm not six three. <laughs> Pay attention. Um, so they are they're about the size of my hands. What they find in the in the cave paintings, sometimes the handprints are small, and they're even either women or some of them maybe children. And the idea there is that it's younger people who accompany the artists into the caves, and their job is it, it, I mean they're a mile down in a cave. Their job is to make sure that the, the lamps stay lit because you don't want those going out. Because it's not like, well, I'll use my cell phone, it's fine. <laughs> and so, it, so while they're making those, making sure that the light stays lit, that they're playing around and they're, use, and they're using the pigment to, to make their handprints, conceivably. Yes? You, early on you mentioned, you showed the basalt uh, formation on Alcatraz. Talk about, yeah. And then you said later, one of the arrowheads you showed, I guess, is from that. Uh -huh. Did you do, I mean, how did you establish that the arrowhead was actually from that formation? I can't tell you it's from that specific formation, okay, okay. but but here's the deal. There are at least three different layers of igneous rock that make up Talcott Mountain. Three different time periods, three different extrusions of lava. They are each of them are different textures. So there are really there's one that's super fine grained. There's one that's much coarser and one that's garbage. So you can't make any rocks out of the garbage rock. Uh, you can't make any tools out of that. The one that's kind of in between, not your best choice. So it's the fine-grained one, which is, I think, the second of the flows. So, and that, the, the exposure I showed you was the second basalt flow, not the first, not the third, but the second. So I'm almost certain that the tools we find are made from that second flow. So at least I know which of the three flows they were exploiting, because the natives knew which was good rock for making stone tools. This went from there versus a flow that is 80 miles away. Um, well, the, the, my, my reasoning would be that that site where I showed you that point is about two miles away. Okay. From, so if you've got really good rock two miles away, you, you don't want to go, you don't okay. need to go 80 no, miles. So yeah, I mean, it, it is indirect <clears throat> what I'm saying. It's likely. It came yeah, it's, I think that's, that's the most likely scenario. Yes? Is that soapstone uh, glacial erratic? Oh man, I wish I could tell you that. We've been digging that for three years and we still haven't figured it out. More than likely, yes. So the, the, you look at the rock, surrounding rock, and there's no other soapstone. I mean, and there are, there's like a boulder over here and a boulder over here and a boulder over here. So in all likelihood, from the north, it's being pushed a, down from there's sources. There's a big from, deposit up in, in North Hampton or somewhere there. Yeah, there was a big one in Bristol, Connecticut. There are a couple in Rhode Island. Oh. Yeah, so so there, and a lot of those, a lot of the old ones have been played out and are, are gone. So we're just lucky this one is is in the uh, state forest, but yeah, it probably was plucked out of some source further north and dropped, all on the east side of the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, yes, sir. Human beings in North America did they migrate west to east? Generally. Um, yeah, when you, when, you, when you combine, it's, it's difficult to say. When you combine all of the, the preponderance of evidence, the convergence of evidence, the archaeology, the geology, the glaciology, and now the genetics, the DNA, the most likely scenario is that most Native Americans alive today are descendants of people who came from Northeast Asia, based on mitochondrial DNA, nuclear DNA, and also when you look at the... the the lithic technology that you see in Northeast Asia, and you look at the earliest lithic technologies in North America, it makes sense. There is an argument that people of the European Upper Paleolithic made it across the ice flows into North America, and there are some prominent archaeologists who think that that is another, at least an additional possible source of population. But based on the on genetics, and it's, and it's a, new, a fairly new field, and there's not a tremendous number of skeletons, um, those folks, the first Americans, are all Asians. They all have Asian DNA. China. Yeah, you're looking at, it's, it's 
the, the Lake Baikal region of Siberia seems to be the best source. So they're coming up through what is today Siberia. And they're, they're adapted to life in the Ice Age. The Bering Lands Bridge is opened up, and animals are moving both ways. And, um, and people are in Northeast Asia, and they're probably following those herds. And you know, it happens slowly. It's not like suddenly there's a land bridge. It's like every year the, the, the hot tides go out, and they don't come out back so far. And it's like old guys like me saying, when I was a boy, you know, and, and the kids don't believe you. And then eventually the tide goes out, and now there's that, that thing that you thought was an island? Well, you can walk to it. And there are animals over there. And this is pretty cool. There's no, no competition. And that slowly but surely people moved from the west to the east. But that's not to say that there isn't another possible infusion of population. And that's the way archaeology and science, that's the way it works. You know, as new data comes, is brought forth, we have to revise our hypotheses. Yes? Great talk, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Well, it's giving me a reason to ask this question, because you put Peru up there. And I went to Machu Picchu just recently. And it's magnificent. Yeah. And all of these artifacts show what the Indians did during the time to mm -hmm. build and do whatever. They said they never found a single tool. What's the theory of how they ever created this? Up at Machu Picchu? Yes. Machu Picchu was, was like, let me, let, me, let me give you an, an analogy, or maybe it's a metaphor. Um, if you went to Camp David today, the, the presidential retreat, would you find a lot of tools that were used in the creation of Camp David? Probably not. The, the construction stuff, that's gone now because it's this presidential retreat. We don't need those tools there. Machu Picchu was effectively a retreat of the, the ruling class in, of the Inca. And so this was a place, it wasn't like the lost city and it wasn't like the place they were hiding. It was like Camp David for them. Uh, and there was a year-round population of people who basically were their servants, but the kinds of tools for making the site, well, you wouldn't need those up there anymore because the site's already been built. That's the best explanation I can give you. But, but then you go further down, down in the valleys where they're making the same kind, the same kind of architecture, same kind of engineering, you find the tools, the, the, the stone tools used for making those Saksuhama, the, the em, enormous stone blocks. And it's the same kind of architecture, the same kind of masonry. So it's not like what's at Machu Picchu is like this this incredible mystery. Um, we know how they made those things because they were, even when the Spanish arrived, they were still making them down lower, not, not at, at uh, Machu Picchu. So, you know, it's so often the case in archaeology, we can't go back in time and actually see what's going on. So there's, there's, we have to surmise stuff. We have to hypothesize stuff. And, and when new data comes forth, we, we change those, those, our explanations. Well, but that's the best thing. the aliens created that. <laughs> You leave now. <laughs> the aliens, yeah, the aliens, man. No. Well, it's always aliens, isn't it? Here's the deal. I was on a National Geographic special with Giorgio, the guy from Ancient Aliens. I never met the guy. You know, we, we film our little bits. And they didn't put this on, on TV, and I can understand why. When I was being interviewed, I said to them, I said, I love being on shows with Giorgio. I've been on a couple of times. Because on those shows... Those are the only times I'm not the guy with the weirdest hair. <laughs> uh, yes, I think. So we have this archaeology canoe trip that the yes. Farmington River Watershed Association hosts every summer. And please come on, it's a blast. Yeah, if, if you don't know about it yet, I uh, want to make sure you know about it now. You mentioned that um, Alsop Meadow is a wonderful site. Um, so I actually have two questions. Number one, would it be possible to blend a tour of Alsop Meadow itself uh, into a canoe trip sometime? And question number two sure. is, uh, if we could all go out for a day, what, what tour of sites in the valley would you suggest? Um, if, if, if you guys see, the lighthouse site has signage, so that's a great place. The um, the, the soapstone... This would be led by you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Soapstone <laughs> quarry. You see, what... The archaeology around here is not 
overtly visual in most cases. Like, I, I can take you out to El Salt Meadow, there's a field. See that field? It's a 5,000 year old site, there's nothing to see. Yeah. But if you go to the soapstone quarry, we're maintaining that, we're hoping to keep that open, we're hoping to build um, a, a, a little kiosk nearby, so that'll be open to people, we'll have a trail to it. So I could take people out to that, that alone is worth you know, half a day. Yes. It's a really cool place. The lighthouse site, just down the road, that's also a really easy one to see. Yeah. Most of the other sites, I could take people to sites that basically it's, trust me on this one, there's an ancient site there. But I would love to do it. We could talk about that. Um, and I think people would probably, uh, it, would, it would please me, I think, as much as it would please anybody else, because I would love to do that. Sally, so is there a sign-in sheet here tonight? I don't have a sign-in sheet. I, we could have a sign-in sheet. Could have a sign-out sheet. <laughs> Nobody leaves without signing their name. If people are interested in a trip like that, maybe uh, you want to leave us your, your email. Oh, yeah, yeah. And we could work something out any, like in the spring, take people out there. Oh, okay. No, absolutely. Hey, my, um, Mike has a sheet because we normally sign in. This is really an official Wild and Scene Study Committee meeting, which is great to have all you people here who aren't on the committee. And we so much appreciate your coming. And I also want to mention that Joyce Kennedy Rames is here tonight, sort of a special <laughs> guest. I knew she'd be embarrassed when I did this. But without Joyce, we never would have gotten our management plan and our study report together. So we very much appreciate all she's done. She went and moved to Colorado, which I probably her mom agrees with me. That this that's, a a that's, that's, that's a hell of a community. Yeah. <laughs> it was just but, for you, Kenny. Oh my God. <laughs> but yeah. Mike, if you would stand by the door and grab people as they go out. So <laughs> that paper on right now. Are oh, you yeah. standing around? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know what? Even, even if we're just talking about we can stop at the Bar Campstead Historical Society. They're they're great folks, and they've got some. Uh, there's an exhibit there from the lighthouse site. Uh, we can go up to the lighthouse site. That's a, that's a little bit of a hike, not much. And then the the Subsidal Quarry is a 15 minute hike, not terribly taxing. But there's all kinds of stuff to see, um, and I do those all the time for the Friends of the American Legion, People State Forest, and for the Bar Campstead Historical Society. I would absolutely love to do at least that much. For, for you guys. And we can, you know, we can go to Alsop Meadow and just walk, walk around. We can go up to Fisher Meadow and walk around. Um, so whatever you like, whatever your preference are, you know, you're never going to get me to not volunteer to get people like where I get to talk. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I, I work for a nature center not in this area, but I came because we, we have started doing a Native American thing because the school systems are now doing the first peoples. Unfortunately, That's great. they're using the Iroquois, so we're trying to get the Tungsis because we live here in Connecticut and most of the people who come to this. Right, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, if you have grandchildren in there or if you're involved in school systems, see if you can get them to uh, do it. It's Absolutely. ELCCT, which is the Environmental Learning Center in Connecticut, we're out of Bristol. One of my favorite things to do these days is, is when I'll get students who come through and do my archaeology yeah. field school, Art. but then what they do after that is that they get jobs teaching in high schools, and they're given a curriculum, social studies, and they go, yeah, that's fine. Let's talk about Indians and archaeology, yeah. and they, so they're kind of through the back door introducing that stuff and, and doing, it, doing it well. They're starting to do that part of the fourth grade curriculum. And that's, that's great. That's great, yeah. Do you have your flyers? I'd be happy to hear them. Oh, I do! Yes. <laughs> I, I, I did not pay her to yes. <laughs> See, I want one. That's my yeah. Thanks, Kenny. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.